In your eagerness to build a bargain basement console killer and join the glorious PC gaming community, you picked up what looked like a great deal on a Dell workstation, on Facebook or wherever, only to find out that it's a custom micro form factor and doesn't have room for a graphics card. The seller vanished like a Cheshire cat, leaving only a grin behind. My name's not important. The answer to your question, however, is very much so. Greetings YouTube human, I'm certain that if you're watching my channel you've probably come across other YouTubers making videos where they turn a discarded office PC into a low-key gaming beast. I've done it myself in the past, having picked up a bargain Dell Optiplex from a used tech retailer and upgraded it with an Nvidia GTX 1050, one of the more powerful graphics cards that can be installed in one of these pre-built machines without upgrading the power supply. Older machines like these may also use bargain priced Sandy Bridge and Ivy Bridge processors and DDR3 RAM, meaning for a relatively small additional outlay you could have your Ricer gaming PC hanging with the big boys. Never say that again, not important. Never, never say that again. So that's it, search eBay and the like for a good deal on an OEM system, pick up a good low power GPU and you're on your way to glorious, modestly priced, ecologically responsible PC Master Race goodness. Video over, smash the like button, subscribe, join the notification squad. Um, actually, just a second, uh, because as it turns out there's a problem with that. Thanks to the lack of forward thinking on the part of executives at some of these OEMs, most of these pre-built PCs share almost identical model numbers to their MFF or micro form factor counterparts. These super compact machines, while compellingly tiny, lack any obvious method of upgrading the graphics, often use laptop RAM and low voltage CPUs, and use cooling solutions that won't support higher clocked CPUs. You can of course forget about overclocking, and what's worse it's entirely possible that while shopping for a budget gaming rig you might accidentally end up with one of these upgrade locked micro form factor potatoes instead. So with that massive preamble out of the way, I recently picked up a used Dell Optiplex 3050 from a second hand store in my hometown. That is, I bought a Dell Optiplex 3050 Micro. It came supplied with a surprisingly competent i5-7500T quad-core CPU, a single 8GB stick of DDR4-2400 RAM and even a 128GB SSD from SanDisk preloaded with Windows 10 Pro. With specs like this, the 3050 Micro could be well suited to service as a light video or photo editing workstation, home server or internet browsing machine. But can it game? Most people will probably say no, now shut up and flip the thing and spend the money on a better PC. And in my case I'm certainly going to do that, but hypothetically what would you do? I mean you could try and get your money back, or you could low spec game of the shit out of your AAA games to run them on the decidedly underpowered Intel HD graphics of this 7th gen i5, or instead you could Frankenstein an eGPU into it with a set of janky looking adapters and an external PSU. I, however, am going to make the best of this bad situation and try to run some less demanding popular free and cheap titles with settings turned down and see what I get. So after quickly switching out the single 8GB RAM stick for a pair of 4GB sticks, I was good to go. Chances are, if you're looking to join the PCMR, it's to play Fortnite with a mouse and keyboard like the pros. So can this hot little mistake perform in Fortnite? Well, kinda. With internal resolution set to 720p or less, and graphical settings at minimum except for viewing distance, it's possible to get what initially feels like a pretty playable experience out of Fortnite. Unfortunately, this is somewhat spoiled by occasional massive stutters when there's a lot going on. Y you know, like around the time you really don't want the game to stutter. Frames hovered around the 36 to 38 mark, but the slowdown into the high 10s and low 20s at the critical moment of combat means you're just going to get frustrated trying to make this work on Intel HD graphics. If your ego can take it, however, the less scrupulous side of the software developer market is more than willing to answer your low spec gaming needs, with any number of knockoff third person battle royales competing for your attention. Creative Destruction was my first foray into the world of Fortnite clones. Expecting a rancid mess of badness, I was pleasantly surprised to find I actually enjoyed my brief play session. My personal experience with Fortnite has mainly involved getting owned by players far better than I, but the few games of CD I played made me feel much less out of my depth. The tutorial was embarrassingly cringeworthy, but the game itself is an enjoyable enough time. Performance at 1080p averaged about 32 FPS and had dips below 20 at awkward moments. This is definitely one to run at 720p, but frankly it doesn't run much better than Fortnite itself. 
Realm Royale, on the other hand, gave me much higher expectations. I hadn't heard much about this game in advance, but I'd played publisher Hi-Rez's Paladins before and knew it was a decent Overwatch knockoff. Fortunately, it seems like Realm Royale is another win for the studio. It manages to convincingly ape the Fortnite formula without being as blatant as Creative Destruction, and I admit I enjoyed this one quite a lot. Playing at 1080p with some settings turned down, this PC managed to keep the game running at 39 to 46 FPS on average, with dips as low as 21. Dropping the resolution further should even allow this scrappy little CPU to run Realm Royale with an average over 60 FPS. PlayerUnknown's Battlegrounds might not have held on to the top spot in the face of competition from Fortnite and Apex Legends, but it still has a huge audience. In this instance, I'm assuming that someone who's just bought their first PC might not have enough left in the budget to pick up the full price game just yet, so I went straight to the clones. Ring of Elysium is a free-to-play PUBG clone that is very close, graphically speaking, to the original, with some small gameplay elements tweaked just enough to hopefully make a persuasive defence in court. With everything turned way down and the resolution at 720p, the game is a bit of a mess, making enemies hard to see and therefore hampering my enjoyment of the game. Moreover, the gameplay simply wasn't smooth, presenting something like a slideshow. For some reason, Afterburner didn't want to benchmark this title, but the footage capture gives a slightly exaggerated idea of just how slow it was. I know some apologists call lower frame rates more cinematic, but 15 FPS was only considered impressive in Buster Keaton's day. Of course, if you really want the PUBG PC experience for free-ish, there's always the mobile game. Android emulator Bluestacks 4 comes pre-configured to translate mouse and keyboard controls to games designed with touchscreens in mind. With the emulator resolution set at 1080p and graphics set to balanced, I enjoyed a very smooth, playable experience in PUBG Mobile on PC. Except for the bugs. One time I got stuck in a vehicle with no way of exiting. Later I found myself in another vehicle, unable to drive any direction except reverse. The auto door opening mechanism is fantastic, when it works. The auto loot pickup system is fantastic, when it works. It's possible that running Tencent's own gaming buddy emulator will work out better, but I refuse to install anything on my PC with a name quite that dodgy. If what you're looking for is something like PUBG but not PUBG, it seems Google's Play Store is full of player likes. I picked one at random, called Free Fire, and gave it a whirl. Unlike PUBG, there's no notification that the system has detected that you're playing on an emulator, as I managed to win this game's equivalent of a chicken dinner twice, and it can't be stressed enough, I suck at battle royales. I presume you're thrown in the shallow end with all the poor saps trying to play on a phone screen. Performance-wise, this game was a pleasure to play, hovering around the 60fps mark most of the time, with rare dips into the high 20s and low 30s. Counter-Strike Global Offensive isn't quite the purist's perfect competitive first-person shooter with its minor concessions to physics and the animator's art just getting in the way of the fragging action, but it's insanely fun and addictive to play with bots, less so with actual humans all of whom kick my ass and call me names. CSGO doesn't require much tweaking to obtain smooth gameplay, even without dropping visual quality too much. I was very pleasantly surprised by what good performance could be teased out of this low-voltage CPU. With some experimentation in the settings, I got the game running in 1080p at an average of 88 frames per second, with 1% lows of 58 frames per second and 0.1% lows of 45. If you're happy to sacrifice resolution further, I don't see why you couldn't lock CSGO to 60 frames per second with this PC. Again, if for some reason playing the free-to-play original is somehow not your cup of tea, there are knockoffs out there. Modern Combat 5 is more of a Call of Duty clone than a CSGO one, with a campaign that reminds me of an Asylum movie and gameplay which, coming from CSGO, is painfully slow. Running at 1080p with effects turned off, Modern Combat 5 managed an average of about 50 FPS. Not too shabby, but also not a game I can highly recommend. I also spent a short amount of time playing the Android emulated squad shooter Guns of Boom, and found it a little lacking in entertaining content. Maybe with a little more time I'd come to appreciate it further, but once again I found myself rather playing CSGO. Using the default quality settings as defined by Bluestacks, I recorded an average FPS of 39 and 0.1% lows of 23. Team Fortress 2 defined the modern squad shooter with cartoonish graphics and player classes that paved the way for games like Overwatch. If you haven't got the money to spare for Overwatch just yet, TF2 is still a fun time and could tide you over until you've saved your pennies. In the team death matches I played, everything ran about as smoothly as one would expect considering it shares an engine with CSGO. I felt happy enough to run in 1080p with low settings and recorded an average of 110fps and 1% lows of just 52fps. 
Like every other popular game in the list, Overwatch itself has derivative free-to-play alternatives available of varying quality. The previously mentioned Paladins is one of the better ones, with a good amount of polish and attention to detail. There are elements that are doubtless designed to fool the casual observer into thinking they're playing Overwatch, however, they aren't overly offensive. Uh, forgive my frankly terrible capture gameplay, I was attempting to use my Xbox One controller and play on the TV, whereby I quickly realised I shouldn't do that ever. Paladins works very nicely on low-end systems, even in 1080p with the detail cranked up a bit, averaging 59 FPS with 1% lows only hitting 33. Finally, I did run a bit of Dota 2, a game which I have little or no experience of prior to this video, and seemingly I completely forgot to grab any gameplay footage at the time. My actual benchmarks on this PC were about 80 average FPS with 1% lows of 23. In conclusion, whether you were scammed by a seller, didn't check the specs properly before you bought, or maybe you were handed it down by a friend or relative, if you find yourself stuck with one of these micro machines, it is perfectly possible to get something like a half decent gaming experience from it. That being said, you'll have a better time if you can return it or resell it and get yourself the genuine non-MFF version. And that's my video. Do you have any horror stories you'd like to share with the group about gaming on a potato? What are your favourite titles to run on integrated graphics? Let me know in the comments, and while you're down there, kindly do the usual YouTube things if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you next time.